Okay, so let's uh, start uh, the uh, the second part of this morning session. So uh, we have uh, Marcos Maia, and he's going to talk about. Uh, can you put the first slide for me to see the title? Yes, geometry and quantum scale. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I was just talking with uh, Rogério, and uh, I asked him to spend two minutes of my talk on my interest in the offer new physics in the space program. One thing that impressed me mostly on Ofer's effort was to form uh, groups of uh, research, effective group of research in Brazil. We are very much here uh, uh, limited to our institutions. We cannot uh, work together in a very efficient way. And I think offers effort deserve this celebration that we are presenting now. In particular, I, I would like to speak about my own interest, which is quantum gravity at present. And uh, it all started uh, recently in the seminar that I attended in the uh, um, Crispino, Basalo uh, program of seminars in Berlin, when he invited uh, uh, Toft, uh, Gerhard Toft for a talk in there, and uh, he started justifying this uh, use of the uh, Perros diagrams and to describe trajectories of particles falling inside a quantum black hole. So uh, he uses this top uh, diagram here, more or less, he shows the one particle leaving the present universe and falling in the R equal to zero singularity, which is the, uh, the Kruskal solution that he was using to represent his quantum black holes. And it comes out in a parallel universe. Well, I commented with him at that time that uh, this is a very simplif simplified description of the embedding problem of uh, geometry and the universe. Uh, it was done by Penrose in the 60s because um, at that time, we didn't know any solution for the embedding of surfaces into space-time. This came about only right after 1963 with uh, John Nash, when he defined the solution of, uh, or found the solution for the embedding problem in differential geometry, uh, uh, embedding of surfaces in differential geometry in general, and in particular, it applies to non-positive metrics. <clears throat> but the uh, thing that I concluded after this remark, I uh, offer, replied saying that uh, he didn't uh, believe that geometry could be valid within the quantum domain, specifically the uh, uh, Euclidean, Euclid um, postulates on geometry. So I started studying this business and I went to uh, see the, the first result of Offer and his supervisor, which is Veltman, in 1972, uh, uh, which uh, uh, earned the uh, Nobel Prize for them. Uh, it necessarily means that there is, there is a geometry valid within the quantum domain, uh, the, the quantum scale, let's say. And the second uh, point that I'm going to emphasize here is that uh, using this fact on the gauge fields, we can derive some interesting results for gravitation uh, the, the renormalization problem of uh, gravitation as well. And this was the negative res result in 1974 from Hoft and, and Feldman. 
saying that gravitation cannot be uh, renormalized. renormalized. Well, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, emergence of geometry in, in gauge theory appeared actually in, in Noether's theorem on the conservation laws. Uh, it's a very interesting thing because she wanted to get an uh, expression for the divergence so that to get the conservation. And she had to add and subtract a certain quantity uh, to the partial derivative. And this turned out to be later on the uh, gauge potentials. Um, the proof of this, I, in the earlier version of these transparencies, I put some detail, but I had to leave because I don't have time. Um, but you can see the complete proof of this in a nice little book by Leite Lopez uh, called uh, Classical Symmetries. You can find it in the uh, CBPF library. The conclusion that uh, I get is this. Noether did some trick, mathematical trick to get the divergence introducing this covariant, gauge covariant derivative. But because of this is a mathematical trick, it need a, a, a proof, a mathematical proof of ex existence. The conclusion uh, comes from differential topology, a, th a theorem very well known in the act called Frobenius theorem. It says that the affine connection in a manifold exists if the associated curvature is integrable. So we have to talk about curvature in a more general sense than just Riemann curvature. And what the hell is this? Uh, integrability condition that he was talking about. So let's start with this uh, Noether's uh, Frobenius theorem uh, using a very uh, simple approach, more simplified approach than the one that you normally find in the books. And um, I, I took a um, sorry, I think I jumped something. Uh, this hand that is, I am showing is a, an example of a manifold, a differentiable manifold, which is covered by a, a mesh, or a, or a, a wire mesh of, uh, you can do it uh, continuously approaching these uh, lines in the, in the hand so that you can make a limit to zero. This is, it makes a differentiable topology. The differentiability means that you can make continuous limit of this thing here. Um, so you take one of these uh, wires from that uh, example and uh, define geodesics. There is a geodesical quadrangle that is composed of two geodesics, and you can uh, make a four point junction of these lines or wires, if you like, and define curvature in a more general sense of the dundrat of Riemann by simply taking a vector field and dragging it around this quadrangle and it gets in a different direction. It, they do not coincide with the original vector W. This difference is called the oper curvature operator. In a more general sense, it's valid for any affine geometry. And this expression is defi defined by this. Uh, in the tangent basis, this last bit here disappears and you get exactly this thing here. I am calling F menu because in the next page, page we are doing the renormalization program. You replace the affine connection by a certain 
coupling constant times the gauge potential. And this G then later, uh, if you apply, I mean, in the renormalization program, you apply, you span this G powers of the Planck energy and compare with the several terms of this expansion so that it, you can prove it to be finite and the, uh, uh, the uh, Wilson theorem shows that this forms a group, sort of a fractal group. So this is well defined in the age theory. And you find that, uh, that curvature is essentially the, um, the Maxwell force in the case of electromagnetic and the nuclear weak and strong forces in the SU2 and the SU3 gauge fields. So the F mu nu that we use in gauge fields are nothing less, more or less, than the curvature of the internal spaces of the gauge fields. So what we learn from this is that the normalization of gauge fields is the same thing equivalent to say that geometric, in the geometrical language, that parallel lines, parallel transport, geodesic curvature remains consistent in the quantum scale. The renormalization of gauge fields means that there is a, 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 a geometry in the quantum scale. So I am referring the uh, answer from Gerard Toft saying that it's possible to get to talk about the, the Euclid axioms of geometry inside the quantum scale, even if we consider the strange observation of quant uh, conditions of quantum mechanics like the Heisenberg uncertainties, the creation and, and the relation of operators in even the entanglements, you can have geometry in within uh, quantum fields. Now, the question comes if this thing also holds true in the geometry of space time. And this was also answered by Toft and Veltman now in a 1974 paper. And they showed specifically that it, general relativity, gravitation in the sense of general relativity is not renormalizable because of this, the, the use of the uh, Newtonian coupling constant in gravitation. More specifically, they show that this, because the physical components or physical dimensions, uh, sorry, uh, of this gravitational constant depends on this M, on the denominator. If you imagine here, comparing this with the Planck uh, energies, you can more or less make cancel this mass or energy with the first order. And but you cannot compensate this for the second order uh, uh, and further. So they conclude that the uh, gravitational field is only uh, renormalizable up to the first loop only. Now, so I understand the problem with gravitation being not quantized by perturbative quantization, if you want to call it that way, is that uh, the constant, the renormalization constant was brought intact from Newtonian mechanics, from Newtonian gravitation into general relativity. And the recent CMB measurement persistently has confirmed that the ordinary matter that composes the, that gives rise to the Newtonian gravitational constant is only 4.5% of the estimated energy of the universe. 
So the conclusion is that general relativity is not quantizable because it's a classical theory. It's, it, interf it measures only Newtonian theory, gravitational attraction, uh, turn into a, a value for all observers in a more general interpretation of given by geometry. But essentially the forces are acting are the, of Newtonian nature. Well, <clears throat> but the observables of general activity are not forces. They are, are not uh, essentially uh, the, the connections as it is, uh, you can take it as in a gauge field, but in the curvature, the Riemann curvature. And as we know, this uh, has five degrees of freedom and you get only two, I spin two fields for gravitational fields. But uh, you can think of a gravitational field of something that perhaps arise from the uh, uh, quantum fields. This was done in 1950 or 1936 by Fils Pauli. He started with the Lagrangian of a spin two fields in Minkowski space time. It has to be trace free so that you get the five degrees of freedom and you get the uh, wave equation. The equations of motion of this Lagrangian is only a, exactly like the equation of uh, a wave equation for the gravitational field in a weak approximation. So uh, it, it, it's natural to think that if you increase the perturbation, uh, modify the, the uh, Minkowski metric by these spin two fields, you get a different spin two field, G mu nu. And it, it's going to be satisfying Einstein's equation. This was found in 1950 by, in the 50s, by Kreichmann, Gupta, Feynman tried to derive the same conclusion from his diagrams, from this uh, uh, field theory. It didn't finish, but it's, it's correct. So, the difference, you get the same Einstein equation. The difference is that instead of G, it has an ordinary uh, mean, uh, arbitrary uh, coupling constant, K. So if the normal heteromerization of gravitational fields, uh, general relativity uh, was not possible with G, it may be possible with the K. And that's the whole business of expanding uh, gravitational theory simply, Einstein gravitational theory, simply by removing G so, and replacing it by a, to another arbitrary constant. Of course, uh, you, you have to be fair and uh, test the toft veltman result of 1974 with this generic K and also the Gorov signotti verification from 1985. So uh, you get um, possibly you may get a different, uh, more general um, general uh, relativity or more general theory of Einstein theory of gravitation, replacing the Newtonian gravitational constant by this uh, arbitrary uh, coupling constant K here that produces a gravitational field generated by a quantum particle. That field, part, the uh, uh, Pauli particle uh, defined, uh, defined by that Lagrangian. Maya, you have five minutes, okay? Okay, I'm finishing. Okay. Uh, 
uh, but yeah, of course you have to be fair with these. Uh, uh, it's not only to theory to do theory. The detection of uh, you must prove this by the experiment, because uh, by removing G, you remove also the um, the uh, hierarchy of the of gravitational fields, and you can make tests in the uh, uh, LHC, for instance, in the high energy physics laboratory. And uh, one possibility is to construct a virtual spherical laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory there in the LHC, something tangent to the 32 kilometers uh, circumference of the LHC. You build a LIGO in there. And you can see the, the spin two graviton erasing from particle in, interactions in there. Uh, if, of course, it's, it's true. But a, a, a theory must be falsifiable. We, we cannot spend the next half century, as we already did, trying to find a theory of gravitation, quantum gravity. We have, we have hundreds of theories. This is impossible. Um, another possibility is to dig on this predicted production of uh, Hawking's mini black holes. And uh, it has to be a rotating black hole, which I call Kerr Krusko solution uh, for the vacuum. And uh, this would be the genuine representation, a geometric representation of the graviton. Of course, what I'm talking here the is the possibility of, of, of we getting a new geometrical language for quantum fundamental interactions. We do not have the same phenomenology of gauge fields in gravitation, but we can use this geometrical language to study quantum gravity. Uh, this is more or less what I had to say to you. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank, thank you, Marcus. Um, so we have time for some questions. I see that Marcelo raised his hand. Go ahead, Marcelo. Uh, Marcus, I didn't uh, catch an important point in my view, is whether with just changing G by K, you make the theory normalizable. That's the idea, yeah. yeah. Another may I make the, the, the well, go ahead, please. What did you Is ask? That the point? I mean, you managed to avoid the, the problem, do you? Well, You're we saying, have to well, ask. What are the requirements for these new constant? Well, it, it, it's just like the G co coupling constant in, in gauge theory. It cannot be determined before you do the renormalization. You do the renormalization, and then after you determine, we don't know what is uh, K uh, before doing these uh, tests. So I'm basing on the conclusion of Toft and Feldman in 1972 that the non-renormalization of Einstein gravitation is due to G only. So let's remove G, put something else and see what we could do I see. What? Uh, and see what we could do just by changing the well you have the a constants. new gravitational theory which is very much like einstein's theory mm -hmm. uh, with the difference that you now you can um, compete with the other fundamental interactions possibly. No. If, the, if we find that it's not possible, then we, we give up this uh, attempt. But the fact is we cannot just spend the next half century playing around with a hundred alternative theories of gravitation just because general relativity is not renormalizable. Yeah, well, another concern Mark, I've got is that the thing, in my view, takes place 
in subplankian scale. No. In sub subplankian scale, we don't even have, it seems that we don't even have the notion of space time. So how to formulate this in a scale that we, we are not really sure that we've got uh, continuous time to formulate equation, et cetera, et cetera. This no. is one point. On yeah. the other hand, we have string theories that seems to, to, to be the most attractive approach to quantum, to solve the quantum graph problem, it is to say. So what is your view about these? Let me search your pity. Uh, we are not sure that in sub planckian scale we've got space times. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think I, I have two, you have two questions there. We also have uh, a sub, uh, string theory as say, perhaps a, a solution to the quantum graph problem. Yeah. No, no, let me clarify this. I'm not talking about Planck scale. Planck scale is something with that is built, was built by Planck in 1914, assuming that uh, there is a special scale uh, unity systems uh, in physics in which everything is measured by centimeters and it requires h bar equal to one, c equal to one, and g, the Newtonian constant equal to g. Now, Newton's constant was made by ordinary matter. And that's why you have uh, this hierarchy the Planck scale is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's a very impossible dimensional scale that you cannot do experiments on that. What I'm trying to see is if it is possible to do quantum gravity at the TEV, at the present scale of observations. And you can only do this if you forget about the Planck scale. Planck, what is, when I say, gravitation has a geometry in quantum, in the quantum scale, do not mis, uh, misunderstood it by Planck scale. I mean, the scale, the, the quantum scale is that in which the, the Heisenberg uh, relations and the uh, particle creation takes place. I don't know what the size is that, yeah, but uh, it it has to be find out. Uh, thank, I think we can continue the discussion, the discussion okay. session. We have plenty of time for the discussions there. But now we need, we need to move on, if that's okay. So thank you, Marcos. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and Marcelo. Uh, so next speaker is uh, Martin Mackler, and he's going to talk about testing general relativity at the kiloparsec scales with gravitational lenses. So um, uh, Marcos, you have to, yes, good, good. So thank you, Martin. Uh, we cannot hear you. We can see your screen, but we cannot hear you. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Uh, now? Yes, now, now we can hear you and see your screen. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for the invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here in this meeting. The series of meetings that was initiated by Ruven Ofer uh, at the beginning of the two, year 2000s, uh, and I think this is a tribute to, to his legacy, so it's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, okay, so this is work in progress, uh, carried out with collaborators uh, from Brazil and Argentina mainly. Um, so, okay, uh, the main motivation is that, okay, we know that dark matter and dark energy uh, cannot be explained by the fundamental, uh, um, fundamental interactions uh, summary model and by general activity, and that's why we need new physics. So we need new physics motivated by observations from space, and that's why that's um, which uh, what motivated this series uh, by Ofer. So I think this fits very nicely in his idea of uh, getting together astronomers and physicists uh, to try to understand this new physics that's proposed by space observations. Um, so in particular, regarding dark energy, there has been a lot of, of uh, attempts to understand uh, what's going on, but we are still uh, basically uh, we haven't learned much. Uh, we know that the cosmological constant fits most data but still there is a lot of dark energy and modified gravity uh, uh, models being used for several reasons, uh, uh, tested and built. 
Uh, and in particular, uh, the, the modified gravity has a, a rich behavior because it's, uh, uh, it has to make a transition between uh, GR at small scales and then something that will make acceleration of the universe at large scales. And this, this, this richness due to this transition uh, makes it very interesting uh, to apply observational tests. And in particular, when we go to kiloparsec scales, um, the, the best way uh, of tens of kiloparsecs, uh, hundreds of kiloparsec scales, the best way to test uh, um, uh, gravity is uh, using strong lensing, uh, but as we will see a combination of lensing and dynamics. So in a quite general setting, if you assume that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic in large scales, and if we look only at the, the scalar perturbations, uh, we may write the metric uh, in this way. So we have two scalar potentials and under quite uh, general assumptions on the matter content uh, in general relativity, these two potentials, they are the same. Um, so if we try to make observations of the difference between these two potentials, then we are making a test of general relativity. Um, we usually denote the ratio of these two mm. potentials as a slip parameter. So uh, if, if in GR, gamma is basically one. So we, if we find that uh, gamma is different from one, basically we can rule out general relativity. Uh, so it's not that uh, we can prove uh, uh, a specific model of uh, modified gravity. I mean, there are models of gravity, modified gravity that have gamma equal one, uh, but basically if you find that gamma is different from one is a strong argument against uh, general relativity. And there is an interesting discussion about the meaning of this parameter. Uh, and if this is a post-Newtonian parameter, uh, sleep parameter. There's a nice poster with a video on this uh, meeting by uh, David Rodriguez and Junior Toniato. So I recommend you to take a look. Uh, in, I will assume here that this gamma is constant. So basically uh, 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 just, just for the sake of trying to make measurements. So uh, um, we'll see this discussion will not be uh, very important here, but uh, I think it's a very nice discussion uh, on, on principles to do, look at this, uh, this one, at this poster. So uh, when we look at the motion of particles under this metric, and if we look at the meeting at, at the limit of non-relativistic particles, so let's say, for example, stars in a galaxy, um, this is the equation of motion uh, for these geodesics. And when we look at new geodesics, so the propagation of light, this is the equation of motion. So basically matter, like dark matter or uh, uh, stars, they will feel only the first potential G00, while uh, light will feel the difference of uh, the sum of the potentials. So that's what makes very interesting uh, uh, to combine the two. So uh, this leads to the well-known Jeans equation uh, uh, for the dynamics, for example, stars in a galaxy, and this leads to the Lanzing equations. So basically by understanding the kinematics uh, in this scale that we are interested, we mean kinematics of the stars in a galaxy, right? Uh, so the dynamics, the motion of stars in an early type galaxy, uh, which, is, uh, 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 which is given by this random motions kind of virial uh, theorem. So for this kind of galaxies, uh, we can study the kinematics through the velocity dispersions of the stars that made the galaxies. And then we can look at the deflection angle uh, and and uh, uh, in the, at these scales, what we have is strong lensing, so the generation of large arcs and Einstein rings. So that's that's what we will look for. So just to have a very simple example, uh, if if we think of, of a potential that's still uh, uh, quite realistic to model an early type galaxy, a single isothermal a sphere, uh, then uh, when we uh, observe the central velocity dispersion, we are measuring this parameter of the potential phi. Right, so we measure velocity dispersion, uh, uh, we fix the, the, the potential or the, the density profile. And when we look at the lensing, um, the, we are assuming gamma is constant, so it's the same potential, but now what we'll measure is the, is the sum of the two, right? Uh, so if we make a, a modeling of the lensing, the parameter that we're measuring is sigma square lens, while if we make a measurement, a direct measurement of the velocity dispersion, we are measuring sigma ops. So basically, this, this is the connection between the two, right? If gamma is equal one, then the two are equal. But if I'm, I'm able to compare the two, I may try to, to see if gamma is different from, from uh, one. So in this very simple example of the singular thermosphere, sphere, the Einstein radius is given by this. So that's something we can increase or measure very simply. Just get an Einstein ring, measure its uh, a, a radius in angle. And then if we know the angular diameter distances from lens to source and from, from source to observer, uh, which means we need to know, of course, the cosmological model, the redshifts. Uh, if we know this, 
and we, we measure this, then we have a measurement of uh, sigma square from the deflection, which we can compare to the one uh, by the, the kinematics. So uh, in a very simple expression, if I'm able to measure this, and I, I know these distances, then, uh, and I know the observed loss dispersion, I'm able to measure them. Okay, so that's the, the idea. Um, uh, so a combination of the loss dispersion and the, the Einstein radius would give a limit on, on gravity. Of course, we need the redshifts of the lens and the source, which is quite uh, difficult to obtain observationally. Uh, and of course, uh, when we make a true modeling, we take into account that we don't have, a, a, the, the profile is not isothermal, uh, the velocity dispersion may have anisotropies, and there are lots of observational factors that go into, so we take all this into account in a standard way. Uh, but I will not go into the details. If there is questions, we can discuss this in the question session. So uh, a summary of the situation we have uh, nowadays is that uh, you can study one single system with a lot of details of the kinematics. So this is this Einstein ring, this is the galaxy. Uh, this is a, a very uh, quite nearby galaxy. It's a, a redshift uh, um, of uh, 0, 0.0 something. Um, so at, at this redshift, you can put an integral field unit, which is a, a camera that for each pixel would we'll take a, a spectrum and you can analyze in, in details and model in details the kinematics of this galaxy and using Hubble Space tele Telescope images of, of this uh, Einstein ring, this high resolution, then you can model also with a, a lot of uh, precision uh, the lensing part. And this is the result for gamma. Uh, if you, uh, it's compatible with one. And if you look only at the statistical certainty, that's really very small uncertainty. But when you account for the systematics that involves all this detailing modeling, then you get a more or less 10% uh, uncertainty in gamma. And it's compatible with gamma equal one. Uh, but again, this is a single uh, a system and a very low redshift, 0 0.04. So we could have a gamma that's changing with redshift. We, we need, of course, to test this in more samples. So that's the other, the other side. Um, so on one hand, we have one system. In the other, on the other hand, you can do this measurement for many, many systems at uh, various redshifts, but then you don't have access to this detailed uh, kinematics. Uh, basically, what you do is to measure one single velocity dispersion, which is kind of an uh, average value of velocity dispersion uh, in, in a fiber or a slit. And also, uh, okay, when you add this, uh, the, the modeling of the, of the, of the lensing. Um, you have to make more assumptions about the light distribution, about how the, 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 the mass is distributed, and about how the anisotropy profile of the velocity distribution, which is usually taken as a constant in this kind of measurements. So when you take this into account, so these are like about 100 systems, but very coarse uh, measurements of the kinematics. Then you again obtain a value that's uh, pretty compatible with general relativity with a 4% uncertainty, which is very impressive. But then if you look into the details of the systematics involved in this analysis, it's about 25%. So uh, we are in this, this situation. Okay. Um, so first, uh, what we wanted to do is to reproduce this, this large, large, large compilation of uh, uh, results from a large compilation of systems, but different one. Uh, so we went to this public catalog named uh, Master Lens Catalog. We collected all the, uh, the, the systems that they had uh, from these uh, you know, 8,000 systems. We collected all that has this information that we need. So uh, um, modeling of the system, the redshift of the lens, the source, and the, this measurement of velocity dispersion. And we run the same machinery that I'm not detailing here uh, to obtain the value of gamma. So again, we assume a constant uh, velocity uh, and an isotropy. Uh, and, um, and we make all these assumptions, even the priors on these quantities. And we obtain uh, that gamma is, again, super compatible uh, with one, and now it's uh, even a smaller uh, error bar, like a 2% error bar, because there are many systems. And that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, this is like a blind analysis. So we, we really collected the systems. We didn't make uh, um, cuts so as to obtain gamma equal uh, clearly to one. So it's kind of a blind analysis. So this shows the power of this kind of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of uh, analysis. But it's also prone to confirmation bias because we are happy, we, make, we copy these assumptions, we get a result that makes sense, and then we go ahead. So I think it's very important that we go and revisit every single step of the assumptions on the model, which are quite strong, uh, the priors, constant velocity dispersion, and so on and so forth. Um, so this, I think, gives an important problem if you are to trust uh, these error bars. Um, so one of the things uh, to improve is, of course, to enhance the studies, statistics also, 
to uh, increase the number of systems. And a nice way uh, to find systems that will be, are suitable for this kind of analysis is to find systems that, have read, that already have spectroscopy data. So a way to find these systems is to look at the spectra. Uh, you have a spectrum of a single uh, galaxy, and sort of nearby galaxy, and then emission lines compatible with a galaxy at higher redshift. So that means that there are two galaxies aligned. If they are aligned, they are likely to be lensed. Also, if the flux of the emission line is high, it means that the, 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 the flux was magnified. So that's a quite efficient way of finding uh, strong lensing systems um, uh, in the spectroscopy. So this has been carried out in Zulandi Space Survey data. And there is a public catalog called CILO, uh, which has all these systems that are candidates from spectroscopy. So what we did was a very simple thing. We, we looked at all these candidates in actual imaging data, uh, not from SDSS, but from higher quality imaging data, starting with hypersuprime cam, but also with DES, with DECALS, uh, and, and uh, KIAs and other surveys. And we found that about 40 of, of these candidates in spectroscopy were actually excellent Einstein rings. Um, so basically, this, we have everything at hand that we need to make this kind of calculation. Uh, uh, also, because of this uh, spectroscopic selection, which is much more homogeneous, it covers also a more restricted uh, range in redshift, uh, makes us uh, uh, able to provide stronger uh, um, and, and less prone to systematic tests of gamma. Um, so that, that's really a, an independent sample. And uh, okay, we are still making the modeling, individual modeling of the, each of these systems to measure uh, the, properly the value of the Einstein range. Um, we also uh, look at in this uh, imaging uh, surveys, actually there's a compilation by uh, Hannah Alves um, of basically all the candidates in all major wide field surveys. And with this compilation, we can uh, uh, make an eye inspection and find nine systems that are suitable to, to, the, to the strong lensing model. Uh, so we are seeking to derive, uh, to obtain from the data, the redshift of the lens and the source of these new systems. And we have a proposal uh, accepted for CASLEA, which is a, a telescope in Argentina, uh, to try to measure these quantities. Uh, it's interesting because it's you know, a um, small telescope, not in the, in the best positions in, in Chile or, or in Hawaii, uh, but we only want spectrum, so seeing is not uh, very important. And even with a sm smaller aperture, I mean, not four or eight meters aperture, uh, we might be able to measure these emission lines. Uh, so that's work in progress. Um, on the other uh, hand, if we try again to reproduce the analysis where we have a high uh, spatial resolution uh, with spectrum so that we can measure the velocity dispersion in many pieces along the, the, the lens. So that's the lens, these are the images. If we can make a map of the velocity dispersion here, then we are able to make an analysis like the first one that I have shown, which is less prone to systematics. And we can do this also from the ground if we use uh, adaptive optics. Uh, so we apply it uh, to this instrument, NIFS in uh, Gemini, to make an adapt adaptive optics observation of this system, uh, where again, we, have a, we are able to have a spectrum on each pixel at, at the limits of, of uh, so that's a 0.1 arc second, that's a uh, you know, very high resolution. Um, the system has also imaging from HST, so we can model it very, very well. Um, and uh, with this combination of the two data, we can improve the modeling of the strong lensing. We can do many things like reconstructing the source, study the source, study you know, metallicity gradients and many interesting things uh, for the astronomers. But from our side to this talk, uh, we, we, in principle, we could be able to recover uh, and mod confidently the dynamics of the system so that we can, uh, we can make this comparison of this lead parameter. However, this survey seems to be cursed, really, if you believe in curse in science. Uh, this, this program was approved several times. This is a, a very sophisticated instrument with uh, four lasers, uh, which make artificial stars. And from this, you compensate the atmosphere. And then you, you, you have these uh, elective optics things. That's a very sensitive instrument. And for many reasons, each time we, we propose and we are approved, there is something that happens. And this time was a small earthquake in, in Hawaii, in Mauna Kea but enough to you know, uh, de-align our system. And so it's not uh, clear, we are still on the queue, but it's not clear that we'll be observed in this semester. Anyway, so we are trying to probe a, 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 an, an intermediate regime uh, between this coarse measurement and this high resolution thing that can be probed with you no know, simpler instruments. So the idea is to obtain, again, spectral uh, resolved, uh, spatially resolved uh, spectroscopic observations, but limited by the scene. So limited by the atmosphere, 
uh, we can go to the optical and things are uh, easier. Uh, we have more systems that we know that we'll have lines uh, that we need to measure the velocity dispersion. Uh, it's not such a detailed measurement, but it's enough uh, to have an idea of the spatial gradient of the velocity dispersion, which again, usually it's, is assumed to be a constant. So it may be a problem in the systematics. Uh, uh, also, this kind of data may, may allow us to, to, to separate better the spectrum of the lens and the source, to study both and to measure more precisely the velocity dispersion. Um, and uh, okay, so that's the idea to be able to start addressing the systematics in this intermediate regime, where we can look for many more model systems that only one with, uh, with this huge uh, IFQ. Um, so these kind of systems that uh, are uh, available nowadays, they fit well on an instrument in uh, Gemini, uh, which is GMOS in the, in the integral field unit. Um, so we propose a program uh, this year to observe uh, three such systems. So these are new systems that were detected in the hypersuprime imaging from the CELO SDSS uh, spectroscopy. Um, but this time we were not awarded uh, time to observe these systems, okay? Our forecast is that we'll be able to measure gamma from these only three systems alone with an uncertainty of 10%. So that's uh, comparable to the first result I have shown. Uh, but what is most important is, uh, uh, is to study the systematic. So probably the error bars will go higher, but with, uh, we understand the systematics. Um, so we didn't get this time, but we, we got time uh, this semester for a pilot program to this pilot program. So we got time to observe one, of, one system with a huge lead, uh, but to try to prove uh, uh, some of the measurements we are proposing. And if you're able to show that this works, then we can make a more systematic studies. Okay, so this was uh, 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 what, what it's possible to do with uh, current data, wide field imaging surveys. As I said at the beginning, we are just visually inspecting these systems and finding them, and we have to model them one by one. Uh, of course, with the new generation of wide field surveys like uh, um, Rubin, Broma, Euclid, uh, we have a flood of systems and it doesn't make sense to be looking at them. So really we have to, uh, to have a way to find them uh, uh, properly automate it automatically and also to model them, right? And, and that's, that's what is more uh, uh, hot in the field now. Um, so what, what we did is to look at uh, simulations. There is a, a challenge called the digital lens finding challenge. We participated in the first one uh, and this was the second one. So it, this, this challenge uh, provides Euclid-like simulations. So from space-based observatory, uh, and, and really, uh, there was a large team of people, you see in the picture several people involved, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of GPU available to make all these tests. So we really test a lot of machine learning uh, 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 networks, so basically convolutional neural networks with very different configurations. And there, all these people, they really you know, tested a lot of uh, architectures. They te tested how to combine the data into the different uh, uh, bands, infrared, the visual, and uh, try to make some pre-processing to teach the neural network, rotate images, filter, and so on and so forth. And after all uh, uh, this work, the best uh, four uh, uh, configurations of machine learning were submitted to this challenge. Uh, and also, and what I think is very in interesting and new from this challenge, is uh, uh, there was also regression uh, challenge. So not only uh, classifying these this systems as uh, strong lenses or not in the simulations, but also measuring, for example, the Einstein radius of these systems in the simulations and trying to see if, uh, if they, they, they match well, okay? So uh, this, is, uh, okay. this is the result. Uh, the, the winner of this challenge was our group, uh, which was uh, led by Klaas Jubon, who's currently at CDPF. Uh, so that was very rewarding that people were making a lot of hard work, including Christmas and New Year's Eve from 2019 to 2020, really a uh, very, uh, just before the, 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 the pandemics, if you see the, the dates, just, just before the pandemics. And okay, so this is the large team at, at CDPF, uh, which was involved. And so not only were we able to get the first result, but also uh, out uh, uh, of, of seven entries of different competitors, uh, six were uh, from this, uh, from these, uh, within the best, uh, four were within the best ones. And also the regression results were good, but there was not a, a thorough comparison uh, of the regression. Okay, so this was very um, promising. Martin, uh, Martin yes. just five, five minutes, please. Okay, so in, in parallel to that, uh, using other another set of, uh, of uh, simulations, 
um, uh, the, the group by Clesio, they were um, uh, so they were looking at simulations which are more like ground-based observations. So they were mock DES uh, simulated systems, uh, and not only they were interested uh, in the regression, so modeling the system, but they were interested in what kind of uh, information we can recover from the systems. Um, so uh, this is they have uh, multiple wave uh, bands, so they have uh, multiple. Uh, um, they have multiple filters, uh, like in the DS, and they, 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 they uh, ask whether you could recover the Einstein radius just by uh, automatically training uh, uh, you know, this neural network. Uh, if you can recover the Einstein radius, the velocity dispersion, the redshift of the lens and the source only by photometry. And the result is pretty impressive. Um, you can recover uh, with 10% systematic error the Einstein ring. Uh, more or less the same for the for the lens redshift, like a photometric redshift, and of course for the source redshift, which usually a uh, faint thing, the error bars are really high, and uh, also the 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 outliers are very high. But what's specifically very interesting is that the velocity dispersion, which is the quantity that matters for this comparison of the slip parameter, right? This quantity is very, very well measured uh, by, the, by the, 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 the neural network. So it appears that a combination of, uh, of the, the you know, Einstein radius, uh, redshift, and, and, and uh, source of the lens that make up sigma v uh, makes this uh, 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 measurement very precise. So you know, uh, like a 5% error, uh, statistical error, and, and less than 5% outliers. So that, that, was, uh, that motivated us to see, OK, Let's imagine that you can run this on a large survey like DS or a future survey from the ground. Uh, and and uh, let's see, let's compare this with the dynamics. Let's think that we can go ahead and have this measurement of the velocity dispersion. Either you go with a telescope and measure one by one, or you have this multiplexed uh, data already available like from DASI or other surveys. So we, 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 we got the result of the recovery of, of, uh, of these quantities from the machine learning. And we generated a fake distribution of velocity dispersions, assuming that gamma is equal one. So we know from our simulation that gamma is equal one. We, we add the standard errors on the velocity dispersion and we generate a fake sample of velocity dispersions. And now the question is, how well can we recover gamma uh, from the, 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 the values of the lensing that were recovered by the machine? And that's the result. So gamma is equal to one with a 2% error. Of course, this is based on simulations, so you're not accounting for a lot of observational errors. But the question was, if the machine learning is to look at only uh, these uh, photometric data, uh, is it able to recover or not the, the, the value of gamma? And the question is yes. So it seems, and I, I think we need to make a lot of tests to be sure, because that's a very bold uh, uh, um, you know, result that it seems that we don't need the, the, the redshift of the source for this specific kind of measurement. And if this is true, that's a, a, that has a lot of impact because this is very hard to obtain. Uh, really, we are only able to obtain the, the redshift of a few uh, of, of the astronomy systems uh, because these are faint, uh, you know, very far away galaxies, only if they have emission lines, basically we're able to measure this. Yes. So if we are able to do that, this, uh, we measure loss dispersion uh, of the lens, which is not that hard, and we make this, this recovery of the quantities from machine learning uh, to measure gamma seems something uh, that's uh, promising. Okay, so just uh, to wrap up, uh, the way to measure uh, modifications of gravity uh, at the scales of hundred, tens of and hundreds of kiloparsecs uh, that I, I, I'm aware of is uh, uh, combining galaxies from lensing with stellar kinematics. Um, this is to measure, of course, gamma, that the slip parameter, that's not only the only impact of modifications of gravity, uh, but that's, that's a way to measure at least this parameter. Um, and we discussed how to measure the slip parameter in three regimes. Uh, one is the, where we have this coarse measurement of the velocity dispersion, uh, basically in one single slit or, or, or fiber. Um, we have used archival data, uh, and uh, this data agrees with generativity and also with previous uh, papers. Um, we have found new systems, and we have uh, still to model them. Uh, and we also used a, 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 um, a compilation of, uh, of, of systems uh, uh, that we are observing to try to obtain the, the relative of the source. Uh, and we made this uh, simulation 
uh, in the case of, uh, um, well, the, the simulation actually was on for DS uh, data, uh, but we think that's uh, even more promising when we have data from this next generation wise to service to do deep learning combined with, uh, with this model to obtain uh, stronger measurements of gamma. Um, we have proposed this intermediate uh, regime with natural scene where we have a coarse measurement of the gradient of the an anisotropy of the velocity dispersion, which is something very important for the systematics. And I think we will apply again uh, uh, for time uh, next semester. But this kind of technique is, is possible for hundreds of systems. Um, so that's, that's promising if it helps a lot in the systematics. Uh, and of course, it's interesting also for many other aspects of the strong lensing beyond just measuring, uh, just measuring gamma. Uh, and um, also we have applied for this uh, adaptive optics uh, analysis, uh, trying to mimic the, the previous analysis. And well, let's see if we still have a, a chance for observations this semester and we can break this curse. Um, so that these are some of the steps towards more precise and robust measurements of the sleep with strong lensing. Um, there are other ways of testing other aspects of modified gravity. Uh, for example, we are looking at the kinematics. So the Jing's equation gets modified by modifications of gravity. And we are seeking other ways to measure, even if gamma is equal one, uh, can we measure other modifications of, uh, of, uh, of gravity? Let's say if you go to a specific setting like on desk theory, we know how the Jing's equation looks like. Can we, can we constrain this uh, with this combination? That's, uh, so that's waiting for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. That that was very impressive, and uh, and congratulations to you and your your group for the uh, for winning this uh, challenge. That that's really Thank incredible. <laughs> that's fantastic. That was really nice. Most of the work actually is Klesu and his team. So uh, yes, I, that's fantastic. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, I remind you that we have discussions at the end of the day. So uh, even even we don't get to all the questions now, we can still discuss. End of the day. So, Marcelo, please go ahead. Marcelo, you're muted. Marcelo. <clears throat> Marcelo, your hand is Microphone. up. Sorry. Yeah. sorry. Uh, it's a very simple question. Uh, I, I did not understand where GR is indeed imposed in the sense that you use one param parameters, that is just gamma and it's just metrical. Where the theory is used somehow in the data or theoretically where? Okay, so the theory is used uh, when you, you compute the geodesics, right? So the relation between you what we measure- and what's... speak a bit more loud, please. Yes, sorry. I think there was a problem with the microphone. I, I'm sorry if, if it was. Uh, I'm now reading the in the in the in the chat that the sound was very low, so too late. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the the metric really goes when you make the modeling. I didn't go well. I can go into a bit more of details. Maybe that will help. So let's let's do the following. Um, let's go to the after uh, talk uh, things. So. What you really have to do to, to drive the dynamics is to, to solve the Jing's equation, okay? So this Jing's equation, uh, which is the, the, the phi from a G0, uh, this is the light profile, this is the radio velocity dispersion. Um, so this is what will be able to connect your measurement with this sigma V uh, with your model, let's say, where gravity appears really, which is the potentials, right? So this is the equation that you solve uh, for the dynamics and for the, the lensing, you solve the standard lensing equations, uh, which are these two equations that I showed in the beginning, right? The, the, um, the new geodesics and geodesics of uh, non-relativistic bodies. So that's really where the theory appears. And what we are doing here is just assuming gamma is a constant. So the two potentials are related by this constant and then and we can go on. There are a lot of steps that go into, but uh, that, that's the idea. So we're really using the, 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 this metric uh, to uh, recover the potential from let's say the data, okay? Uh, now, as I said, this is an assumption that gamma is a constant and we can do other things uh, and, and this genes equation will be modified by modified gravity and this will appear explicitly. So there are you know, other ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't know so if this if, answered your question. If you want to apply to another theory, the same scheme, the, this 
is the point where you have to theoretically work with. Is that right? Right, that's correct. So Fine. we derive the, the, the geodesics from for, you know, non relativistic and new geodesics. So yeah. that's where the, the uh -huh. game starts. Uh -huh. So Ooh. if we are not assuming gamma equal constant and we, you know, we want to start mm -hmm. with Rondersky or any specific theory, you can do the same procedure, but you will start there and you, you modify the equations. Yeah. yeah. May I have another question, Rogério? Uh, Marcelo, would you mind saving the question for the discussion? Yeah, because... for the, the, the end of the day. Okay, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, just say, save, save your question. questions. Sorry. sorry we, no, 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 that's okay. So please, uh, I, I want to remind, you, uh, remind everybody that we have a discussion session at the end of the day where you're more than welcome. Actually, it's important to bring questions and uh, to continue the discussions. So I, I'd like to thank Martin and Marcos, uh, Maria for their talks. And uh, we'll break for lunch and we'll come back at 2 p.m., okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, good. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Maya. Maya, I, I want to ask you, uh, can you send the link of this book of Leite Lopez that is in the uh, CPPF library? I couldn't find it. Yeah, I, I used to uh, have a, a Xerox copy of that thing to lend to my students. Then I learned that they have this in the CBPF. Perhaps Marcelo can uh, help us to find it. That'd be great. I tried to find it, I couldn't find uh, it. But I don't have the, uh, the, the, the PDF of it. I have the Xerox, old Xerox copy. <laughs> yeah, Marcelo, that's your mission now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll check with the department that deal with us. But uh, Rogério, you can ask them, they will, they will help you anyway. Oh, so not, not, okay. It's but, really Marcelo, you, 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 are, you are from the house. So Just can, send uh, me the precise book, <laughs> because Late Lab wrote more than three books. Uh, I think it's uh, symmetries. Let me see. Uh, <laughs> classical, classical symmetries. It's from my school. A school given in Colombia, I think we are sponsored by the Latin ah. American uh, CLAF thing that we had in the past. Well, it's not a book, it's a, it's a set of lectures. Uh, yeah. it's, it's been a, 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 a postilla. A postilla. A postilla. Okay. Or something. I'll check that for you, Rogério. Thank you, Marcelo. Okay. Uh, now I can see Martin. Hi, Martin. I couldn't see you before. Yes, now I notice when I close my, my presentation, I noticed that I wasn't being shown in the camera. I don't know why. I just turned on and off. And, uh, no, I, I was going to make a joke. <laughs> but 